Well, well, the wait is over. Welcome to All About Film, and today we are going to talk about Kodak T-Max 100. This video discusses that Kodak T-Max 100 film and looks at how to use it, the film's characteristics, technical details, and so, so many sample images. T-Max 100 is a medium film with a box speed of 100 ISO and significant latitude on the slow side. It's available in multiple formats, including 35mm in 24 and 36 exposures, as well as 100 foot lengths, 120, 4x5, and other sheet film formats. I didn't write them all down in the script, I apologize, but at least 8x10, I think. Anyway, it also can be had in uncommon sheet film formats through special bulk lot orders. For the recommended rating, I like T-Max 100 at box speed and slower. 50 and 64 ISO worked particularly well in higher contrast developers. By 32 ISO, I found the images to be a bit too muddy, though recoverable. And that said, pulling to 32 ISO does work for harsh lighting conditions. For filters, orange, yellow, and this one is very surprising, pink, did well with improving shadow detail and sky contrast in images, which will help with landscapes. Green, blue, and brown filters I found to reduce image clarity and introduce needless muddiness. For my personally preferred format, I like T-Max in each format. It's one of those rare films that I'm happy to shoot across platforms. To get the most out of this film, T-Max as a lineup makes achieving good results easy. It's kind of like putting your finger on the scale, so you don't need to do much to get the most out of this film. I would suggest finding some developers you like with T-Max 100, sticking to those, and really getting the most from this stock by learning to use it well and effectively in a consistent manner. Subjects which work well and poorly with T-Max 100 being a generalist film here, it does all of these things, most all things, really well. If you personally can effectively shoot a subject in black and white with any medium speed film, T-Max 100 will hold up its end of the bargain and give you good results. There are some exceptions. Nighttime shots, low light shot, low, low light shots if you're shooting low key, with good subject lighting can be pretty de decent, but nighttime shots like star trails or astrophotography, not gonna work. Indoor sports, probably not your best use of this film also. Now, one last tip for T-Max 100. Kodak recommends in high contrast scenes overexposing the film by one to two stops. I'd personally suggest bracketing for that. Kodak further recommends normal development in those same scenes with overexposure which means that you can adjust mid-roll to high contrast lighting situations, such as if you're outside and suddenly lose cloud cover. When you do that, that's going to overexpose the frame that you're shooting a decent amount, and you're going to lose contrast due to that negative being thick. That's why overexposing one to two stops in high contrast scenes reduces your contrast because it's just so much information on the negative.
for grain, by the time you get to 645, there is none in the images and they're almost completely indistinguishable from a very good high quality, high megapixel digital photo. Even on 35 millimeter and half frame 35 millimeter grain is hard to detect and that owes to the incredibly fine grain profile. Images from TMAX 100 look in some ways almost too polished and perfect. By the time you're in sheet film territory, there's no real improvement to image tonality in grain versus, say, medium format. However, the film's speed makes it an incredible option for any kind of large format work. And if you execute that well, the results on sheet film will far exceed anything that digital offers. For your tonality and tonal range, it's exceptional. TMAX 100 is one of the best films on the market in this regard. With proper film developing technique, proper print exposure on the enlarger technique, and proper print developing in the chemistry technique, an image taken on TMAX can easily contain more tonal and dynamic range than any other film of which I'm aware. In fact, the single greatest failing of this video is that the digital files I used cannot come close to replicating how the negatives that I took actually deliver images. For acuteness, as would be expected of a high-end black and white film, it's good. You'll find that tones transition quickly and in a pleasing manner. More than just being a fast or slow transition between tones, I find that TMAX 100 has a particularly pleasant look about the tonal transitions. For contrast, this will vary by the specific developer, but in general, it's good. Some people argue that it's too high, and for a long time, I agreed with that. I do tend to think that flatter films are preferable for both scanning and enlarger-based printing. However, with use, I grew to really like the look TMAX 100 provides, and I would make an argument here that to an extent greater than most films, the contrast profile in TMAX 100 will force you to learn the zone system or, at minimum, how to capitalize on spot metering to control your exposures. Learning either of those things will help you obtain shadow details and have recoverable highlight details. Paired with good developing practice, proper metering will do wonders to make TMAX 100 behave in a manner less like the film's detractors dislike. For sharpness, the current generation of TMAX 100 is, insofar as I know, the sharpest 100 ISO film ever made. The Kodak datasheet indicates that the line pairs per millimeter are 200 with a contrast ratio of 1000 to 1, which is exceptional. In my experience, a 35 millimeter negative can easily be enlarged to a large poster size print if you have a suitably sharp taking and enlarging lens. Note, that this resolving power rating that Kodak provides in the datasheet will vary by developer time, temperature, technique, and conditions. So they're telling you what it can do under ideal, the best of conditions. For your dynamic range, your dynamic range is good. Reportedly, though I could not find a specific Kodak reference for this, TMAX 100 has up to 13 stops of dynamic range. Now I can almost back that up. Some of my examples in this video exhibit 11 or more stops of dynamic range. One big asterisk here is that that is true if you shoot at box speed or no more than one stop of push and no more than two stops of pull, best case. Personal preference on this, I would dial that back to two-thirds stop of push and one stop of pull to obtain the maximum dynamic range out of this film. If you go beyond those limits, your black tones will suffer and your overall histogram will clip prematurely. For digital conversion, TMAX 100 converts fantastically to digital images. The negatives work well with a high-resolution DSLR for digital camera scanning and a RAW-based workflow will help you mimic traditional analog darkroom printing capabilities on your computer. Scans are okay, 
though the inherently lossy process of JPEG conversion that most labs include in their basic scanning price really does a disservice to TMAX 100. So, strong recommendation here. Digitize your TMAX 100 with a DSLR in raw capture using either a macro lens or an enlarger lens on a bellows. Your finished results will be significantly improved vice lab scans.
Firstly, you'll notice that this spectral sensitivity chart has two lines. One for 1.0x greater than density minimum, which is demon, and one for 0.3x, well, 0.3 times greater than demon. You can have both lines on the same negative and any number of infinite lines in between. Where your negatives have thinner areas, not quite shadows, they will have spectral sensitivity more like the top line. In areas of normal density, the spectral sensitivity will perform more like the lower line. The spectral sensitivity curve is used to describe the film's relative sensitivity, which is the y-axis to visible light colors on the x. So if we look at the spectral sensitivity curves, the higher the line goes on the, uh, on the y-axis, then that means the greater the maximum density of the film's ability to record that wavelength of light. So if we look over here on the 400 nanometer wavelength, which is blue, purple, what this chart tells you is that this film is very receptive to light to the blue tones to the cool tones in the visible light spectrum it's moderately in different ways receptive to the greens and yellows and oranges going into very uh, non-responsive to red tones now this is the 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 sharp drop off on the reds is pretty common for most black and white films but what's really interesting about this film is the way that it responds to the cool tone lights light colors. Now what that means, what that should mean in theory, is that with blue filters it will be brighter. And that should also mean, again in theory, that a blue filter will flatter human subjects very well, so whereas a red filter would not. A big part of that is because of the inherent redness of all human skin because our blood is red. So blue filters tend to flatten that out in black and white photography. So that, I think, is an incredibly interesting aspect of this film, the way that it sees cool light much more powerfully than the mid-range mid visible light spectrum and definitely the warm tone light visible light spectrum. For this test, I used my standard filter lineup of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, tobacco, pink, and purple. So I'm going to say I think I might have bought some trash filters because these results are not what I expected based on that spectral sensitivity curve. They are far too similar. The way that these should work and the results that you can see very faint hints of are that warm tone filters should make the skies, mountains, tr and tree leaves more dramatic while making the tree trunks and the rocks lighter. The mountain's tonal recession should be amplified by warm tone filters, especially the orange filter. The cool tone filters should make the mountains just plain white and lighten the tree leaves while darkening the trunks. 
So yes, that does happen, but not to the extent that I expected. One last note, the datasheet provides a guide for increased exposure when using filters. So I've included the table from the datasheet in this video. With the data in the table presented here, what you need to do to use filters well and effectively is shoot with manual exposure settings. You'll want to take your meter reading without a filter, and then you're going to increase the actual exposure settings by the amount shown uh, in the table based on the filter factor for the specific color of filter you're using. You need to do it this way because the film's spectral sensitivity is based on full spectrum light and filters eliminate most of the visible spectrum. The compensation in this table is to allow the film's accordingly narrower area of affected sensitivity to expose and develop tones that are closer to an image taken with full spectrum light. For all of us Minolta Alpha 9 users, if you're shooting at 1 12,000th of a second, you need to add a third of a stop to your aperture. For every shutter speed from 1 10,000th of a second to a full second, no correction is needed. For 1 to 10 seconds, a third stop is needed and should be done by increasing your aperture. For 10 to 100 seconds, a half stop is needed and again should be done with aperture control. Alternatively, you can increase your shutter speed by 15 seconds in, this, in the, the 10 to 100 second range if you need a specific aperture for your image. For exposures exceeding 100 seconds, you can compensate by opening your aperture one stop or by adding 200 seconds to your exposure. Now all of those times from one second up to 100 seconds or longer, that is your metered time. There's no, there's no chart here that shows a compensation time. Now insofar as I know, if you do that, if you follow those tips, you do not need to compensate in developing when you uh, properly expose in camera for reciprocity failure. Kodak does not provide a specific latitude range, but they do indicate that TMAX has good latitude. I would suggest that their best guide for latitude is on the first page of the data sheet, right column, paragraph two. Now that said, the massive development chart for this film spans 25 to 6400 ISO. I shot TMAX 100 from 12 to 200 ISO. Pushing beyond 200 seems absolutely bonkers to me, and I would not personally try it or recommend it. From personal experience, I also suggest not pulling TMAX 100 beyond 32 ISO. I find that pushing and pulling TMAX 100 beyond a fairly narrow range of exposure sensitivity sacrifices a great deal of image character and quality. You can do it, you're just not going to be getting images that look like TMAX 100 images, so why do it? I have never been more surprised by which developers I liked and hated than I was with this film. Okay, so I tried a lot of developers. In some, I tried 25 different developer dilution sensitivity combinations. Some I really expected to like, such as Polydoll, which was a Kodak product, and TMAX developer, which did fine at OnePlus 4. Some I really expected I would hate, and for at least one of them I was right, but when I sat down and looked at my results, all 210 photos that made the cut for this video, I liked the images from RPXD plus 75 for stand developing with box and pulled sensitivities the best. And that surprised the heck out of me. D76 plus three was a very close second, Rodinol plus 75 was a close third, and TMAX developer at 1 plus 4 was very close to or possibly on par with that Rodinol concentration, but I personally liked the Rodinol look a little bit more. Between those four, any one of them would be an amazing choice as your go-to, except of course RPXD because it's not made anymore, so I guess D76 plus 3 it is. A quick note on the TMAX developers. I tried it at 1.4, 1.7, and 1.9. Now, TMAX Developer is a higher contrast developer, and my developer chemistry is often around 22 degrees Celsius, which is 72 degrees freedom. In theory, that should yield approximately 8% less contrast than the recommended development temperature of 24 degrees Celsius with TMAX Developer. 
Given that I don't adjust times and prefer flatter negatives when it comes to digitizing, I should be really happy with the way that Tmax Developer performed, but I only liked it at 1 plus 4 and I recommend avoiding it at 1 plus 7 and 1 plus 9. Oh boy, were there some bad combos here. Polydoll stock was the worst, and that really surprised me because it's basically Microdoll X, and while I tend to think that Microdoll X would be a good developer for Kodak films, that consistently fails to hold true for modern Kodak stocks. It's most accurate to say that I do not personally like the way that modern Kodak stocks perform in Microdoll X, and it's inconsistent for reasons that I haven't yet figured out. Also, when I pushed Tmax 100, good old RPXD plus 75 really failed to deliver. The last developer I would avoid is Ilfasol 3. It shouldn't shock anyone that an Ilford developer isn't the best selection for a Kodak film. And as a general rule, I think Ilfasol 3 is a poor choice for any Kodak stock. But I'm also slightly biased, having a long-standing feeling for Ilfasol 3 of meh that has only recently started to change. I know Kodak films are a luxury, or more accurately, are priced like luxury goods. They are largely, within the film world, luxury items. The T-Max line, especially in 100, performs staggeringly well, consistently, and in myriad difficult settings. Kodak's film detractors will say that they are priced like Patek Philippi and perform like Timex, I disagree. I would say, at worst, they perform as priced and, generally, perform better. For a long time, I was not a fan of T-Max 100. I did, and still do, much prefer the look from the long-dead Plus X 125. When Plus X was discontinued, what's that, about seven, eight, nine years ago, whatever it was, I would have traded T-Max 100 for it. I still would, by the way. That said, T-Max 100 is a good successor to my old favorite film. It won't replace it, much like the first dog you own as an adult will not replace the dog you had as a kid. It's different. It's its own thing. T-Max 100 performs in a manner which cannot, for any reason, be described in terms that aren't substantially more positive than not. Here is, I think, the best and most accurate praise you will hear about T-Max 100 from me or most anyone else. T-Max 100 is amenable to how you shoot. Do you want blacks and shadows as dark as the void sense of humor? It can do that. Do you want to retain shadow and highlight detail in the same full sun shot? Yes, metered and developed well, it can do that too. It can even do both of those things on the same roll. The T-Max films are empirically amazing films developed well and beautifully with consistent performance and predictability. T-Max 100 exemplifies all the best qualities of the entire T-Max line. And yes, I will miss using it as I continue with this series. But honestly, I'm going to miss it less than most of the other films I've really liked. The 100 ISO black and white film space has a lot of competition. Kodak, Ilford, Fuji, Foma, Kentmere, Astrum, Adox, and Raleigh all have their offerings, and, hot take, all of them are good. Standing atop a crowd that boasts stellar film stocks like Acros 2, RPX 100, CHS 100, and Delta 100 takes, I think, just a bit more than T-Max has to offer. That said, T-Max does everything a medium-speed film should do and it does it well, and that's not something that holds true for all of the competition. T-Max 100 is an ideal medium speed film for multi-format shooters, multi-subject shooters, and also for specialists who want to focus on truly refining their film work for a specific subject. The list of subjects T-Max 100 handles poorly, star trails, indoor action, that's far, far shorter than the similar list for most comparable films in the market. And that list of two things that I can think of is almost unfindable next to the massive list of subjects that T-Max 100 handles very well. So my relationship with T-Max 100 remains 
conflicted. I have a ton of respect for what it can do and for what it allows photographers to do. I don't personally like the image aesthetic that it tends to provide. I do like using it in 120 and sheet film formats. I am very excited to jump to my next 100 ISO black and white film review, however. Ultimately, though, what I can say about TMAX 100 is that it will perform well for photographers of basically any skill. It's an empirically great stock and definitely a worthy favorite 100 ISO black and white film.